Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum of Iowa. The Iowa History 101 webinars share Iowa stories in the history of the state through a cultural history lens on the second and fourth Thursdays of each month. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today we will take a deep dive into the relationship between Sioux City, its residents, and the steamboat trade. Highlighting the years from 1868 to 1873 emphasizes the unique nature of this relationship during a time when Sioux City and the steamboat trade were in transition. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function but if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague Kennedy Heimerdinger is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our presenter, Cassie Nelson. Cassie is a historian of the American West who specializes in the history of the Overland Trail and steamboating on the Upper Missouri. In 2013, she earned her Master's of Arts in History from the University of Nebraska at Kearney. In 2016, she received the Charles Red Center's Independent and Creative Work Award. And in 2020, she received the research grant for authors from the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs. Cassie also has a background in professional genealogy and enjoys combining the best practices of each respective field. She's currently an adjunct history instructor with Bellevue University in Bellevue, Nebraska. And now I'm very happy to turn it over to Cassie to begin the webinar. Well, good afternoon. I want to thank all of you in advance for joining us today as we talk about steamboats. And I also want to kind of apologize in advance if my voice gets a bit scratchy at all, as I have been battling influenza A since Monday and unfortunately am not quite where I hope to be by today. Uh, take care of yourselves out there. Trust me when I say that you do not want to get this, um, but I'm certainly not going to let it get in the way of me talking about steamboats. Um, now I have been researching the history of steamboating on the Upper Missouri River, which means the portion of the river from Sioux City northward from a more social perspective than most other historians, focusing mainly on the lives of the crew members and in particular, um, those like Captain James McGarry, who I have a picture of here actually, for, uh, well, nearly a decade. And steamboats are, are one of those things that I think a lot of people, including my past self admittedly, uh, sometimes roll their eyes at and think that it's a, it's a boring topic and kind of tune out. Uh, but there are so many different facets to the history of steamboat that go beyond the cargo they carried or the technology of the boat. Um, they carry a rich social and cultural history for those who worked aboard the boats and the communities they serviced. For the worse or for the better, they are also a big part of the military, Native American, and environmental history of the American West as well. Uh, now, when I first started um, working on this project, it was admittedly to kind of find out some more information about this guy here, James McGarry, to see what he had been up to during these years. Um, but then as I started to dig a little bit more, I started noticing things and figured out that Sioux City really did have um, a very unique relationship with the steamboat trade. Uh, now, before we dig too much into that relationship, I want to take a step back and give you some kind of like general background history so you can place what was happening in Sioux City into the proper context. Much of the steamboat history has focused on the development of boats and the trades as it pertains to the Eastern rivers, such as the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. Perhaps that is fair given the dispersal of the population, dispersal of the trade, and just where the majority of the boats were. But the idea of the steamboat was born in the late 1700s, and by 1807, Robert Fulton had made his first steamboat trip on the Hudson River. And by 1817, there were steamboats in St. Louis, on the Mississippi, and not many years later, but just two, 
uh, the first attempt to take a boat up the Missouri River occurred, and it got all the way up to about Independence, about 250 miles north of St. Louis. Also in 1817, military engineer Stephen Long proposed to the government that steamboats could be used from an exploration and a military expedition standpoint. And during 1819, 1820, he led an expedition consisting of several boats with the Western engineer being the first to successfully reach the area that is now Council Bluffs. Uh, this was shown as kind of like a show of force for the Native American populations. They wanted to admittedly intimidate the Native Americans and show them what technology they had. And it worked to an extent. Uh, Native Americans referred to steamboats as fire canoes. Now, the next time a steamboat was sent up the Missouri River wasn't actually until 1831, when the American Fur Company, in conjunction once again with the government, was able to get the boat, the Yellowstone, up to its trading post at Fort Union, which is in present day eastern North Dakota, almost by the border of Montana. And it wasn't until 1859 that the first boat, the Chippewa, actually made it all the way up to the head of navigation, which is the farthest that the boats can go due to water levels and river conditions of Fort Benton in Montana. Now, early on, those like Stephen Long acknowledged how steamboats that plied the Missouri River had to be different from those on the Mississippi. The Mississippi was more narrow, shallow, and more perilous overall. One of the first innovations was to move the wheel from the side to the stern of the boat. Snags, like this one that sank the Arabia, along with Sawyer sandbars and narrow, cha narrow channels was one of the biggest challenges to navigating the Missouri. Um, in simple terms, it was a dangerous river. And I believe it was Mark Twain who wrote about a common saying in practice among, among steamboats saying, we used to separate the men from the boys at the mouth of Missouri. The boys went up the Mississippi and the men went up the Big Muddy. Now, St. Louis was the main hub from which steamboat trade for both the Mississippi and the Missouri centered for decades. As settlements expanded, trade expanded, so did St. Louis's importance. Steamboats ventured up the river on a more regular basis, particularly during the 1850s, to carry much needed supplies to new settlements and towns. These towns greeted boats with much enthusiasm. Depending where on the river they were located, they may have gone months and months without any deliveries. The water levels and the ice dictated when steamboats were able to travel and how far up the river they could go. Early spring meant high water levels, but the ice first had to break up. The river would rise when the snow in the mountains melted, and sometimes there were earlier rises depending on uh, the melting snowpack along the tributaries as well. By October, the water levels were pretty low to be on the river. And being on the river in November was virtually unheard of unless the, the captains were, um, well, they, they called them crazy in the newspapers because they were to be on the rivers that late. And that was the case with my Captain McGarry frequently. Now the time frame in between, you had these weather parameters, right? You had the breaking up of the ice and the water levels going up and the water levels going down is what I refer to as steamboat season. The way some of these towns anticipated the steamboat season was akin to how they anticipated Christmas. So in that way, our, our timing here is very, very good for this presentation. Pardon me, I'm going to take a quick sip so that you guys can continue to hear me. So things really got interesting in the 1860s. A series of gold rushes in Idaho and Montana drew miners north and it really exasperated tensions with Native Americans. The main overland route to the gold fields was the Bozeman Trail. And I have a map here where you can see it was. There's also some other tracks and things on there. Um, well, it was closed after a number of attacks. And this meant that the best option for transporting people and goods was now the Missouri River. Boats carried miners and merchant goods alike up to Fort Benton, Montana, from which they traveled overland to their final destination. Unfortunately, the gold rush didn't last long, and nearly as soon as it ended, the water levels dropped. The steamboat business came to a near screeching halt by comparison. Meanwhile, Sioux City had done a great deal of growing up. The town was first platted in 1854 during a land boom 
and driven by speculators who thought the railroad would come to the area much sooner than it did. Steamboats did come and were regularly making an appearance by the summer of 1856. They helped the town grow and encouraged local merchants to expand. The town grew in response to the steamboats with the building of shops along the riverfront near the mouth of the Perry Creek in Ferry Landing was also included. The town business center was built on a bluff overlooking the creek and some of the town's first streets ran parallel to the river and the levee. The federal government was a driving force in business and goods as goods needed to be transported to Indian agencies and military posts up rivers. Early town settler John H. Charles recalled in his reminiscence from 1906 that, quote, everything needed in a steamboat town came up the river by steamboat from St. Louis or Council Bluffs. The regular mail came this way. And during my first year residence in Sioux City, which was 1857, a number of boats ran regularly in the Sioux City trade. Coming up from St. Louis about once a month, they brought us almost everything. Like other steamboat towns, Sioux City had an early favorite boat one that was reported on with great frequency and spoken with great admiration, the steamer Omaha. The Sioux City Register uh, reported on it quite frequently and on April 16th of 1859, they wrote, we had merely time last week to mention the arrival and departure of the above favorite steamer at our wharf, but we think the event is worth something more than a mere passing notice. The Omaha is regarded as belonging to Sioux City. She is one of the valuable and reliable institutions of this country. She is the first boat expected in the spring, is the one dependent on through the season, is the last to come to our port in the fall, and never fails to meet the expectations of travelers and shippers. These feelings were evidently mutual as a log book of the steamer Omaha was published with the following expressing the steamboatman praise for Sioux Cityans. They said, Sioux City deserves the credit of being the one, if not the best places on the river for promptness in selling their freight bills. No sooner are the goods delivered than the money is ready. And this is always invariably the case. Now that's not quite as poetic what Sioux City had written about the Omaha, but in steamboat men language that was professing love for Sioux City. And more than expressing praise, this article is the beginning of a common refrain in years to come. And that was that Sioux City was better than others. For the steamboat trade. We see others agreeing with this sentiment early on. The Dubuque Herald ran an article in 1860 that praised the advantage and favorably situated of the whole state of Iowa, but in particular Sioux City. The town's importance along the river to the steamboat trade that already existed up to the head of navigation was acknowledged. The town was deemed to, quote, destined to become the great distributing point for northwestern Iowa. In 1863, George D. Hill, who was the Surveyor General of Dakota, sang the praises of the town. He pointed out how it was situated on the river, protected from the winds, how it had a good landing, favorable trade existed between it and Nebraska and Dakota. And he even referred to it as the head of regular steamboat navigation on the Missouri, about five, to, five years too early with that. Overall, in early newspapers, we see the reoccurring themes that Sioux City could serve the steamboat trade unlike any others, and that it was their destiny to become a great center of trade. Now, despite early predictions and calls for the destiny to be met, the city did not become a main hub until the arrival of railroads in 1868. During this era, there was no singular option for transporting goods everywhere they needed to go. A trade network existed and part of being a successful steamboat businessman was learning how to navigate these networks and how to leverage trade relationships in a way that was profitable. For example, goods first may have to be shipped by boat to a port like Chicago and then travel by train to St. Louis. From there, goods would be transported by boat because at the time and for many years to come, the government still needed goods to be sent to where the trains could not yet go. Once goods were delivered, by steamboat, they then may be handed off to overland freighters, which up in Montana, this often meant mule teams like the Diamond Dar, who would then take them over the mountains to their final destination point. Each component of the network was dependent upon the other, but also at times in direct competition with each other. The history of 
each component of these networks is subsequently and intrinsically connected. Now, as a steamboat historian like myself, it can be frustrating at times as when I want to discuss steamboats and keep the focus on steamboats, people inevitably have questions about railroads, uh, which is fine. Please ask away. Um, but it's kind of, they get a little bit overshadowed. But when we come to um, cities such as Sioux City, their history is so intrinsically connected that you can't really talk about one without the other. And Sioux City also had the added um, historical figure of Job Lawrence that wasn't always present in other towns. He uh, really helped fuse those two industries together and he gave new meaning to the old adage that if you can't beat them, join them. Arguably, uh, this connection is one of the reasons why Sioux City had such a strong relationship with the steamboat trade. In 1868, the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad reached Sioux City and the Sioux City and Pacific Railroad lines were also connected. The same year was when Joe Lawrence formed the Northwest Transportation Company, which would work with the railroads to ship goods from Chicago to Sioux City via rail and then would transport the goods by boat up to Fort Button. The Chicago Tribune called this a radical change in transportation that would break the monopoly that St. Louis had long held and not only be good for the region, but the country as a whole. Chicago Post echoed these sentiments, adding that the business that had resulted from the gold rush was underappreciated. After a rough start due to land speculations gone bad, delay of the train, and a depression, it would seem that Sioux City was at long last about to receive the success they dreamed of. Shipping goods from uh, Chicago to Sioux City instead of St. Louis, then by boat, meant that the goods could be obviously shipped quicker, a good two weeks more. It was also substantially cheaper. Bypassing the lower part of the Missouri meant bypassing paying insurance to transport goods on the lower and much more dangerous part of the river. The Chicago Post was not exaggerating when they wrote, so bad indeed is the part between Omaha and Sioux City that the river men aptly christened it the grave of steamboats and seriously proposed that it be declared unnavigable. In some instances, shipping goods via rail to Sioux City ended up costing less than what the insurance alone previously cost. The benefit for local Sioux City merchants and wholesalers was that this effectively removed St. Louis from serving as a sort of middleman between them and the manufacturers back east. Joe Lawrence moved quickly to turn his company into a success. He started by building a large warehouse in the spring of 1868. It was rumored to be the largest on the Missouri River at the time. The local newspaper expressed cautious praise at first, stating that Lawrence was justified in the belief that the enterprise will prove a success and that we certainly hope it may be. After the success of his first season in 1868, Lawrence doubled the size of his fleet and began building of ways along the river. Work began in November and was well underway by December. Um, now, for those of you who don't know what ways are, it's essentially like a series of, of um, like beams and that type of thing. It's construction for you to pull your steamboats up out of the river. It was quite the endeavor and news of it was carried all the way to Cincinnati where the Cincinnati commercial reported Admiral Gerald Lawrence, president of the Northwest Transportation Company is building ways here at the cost of $12,000 with the capacity to haul out four boats abreast. This company will do their own buildings and repairs here. The contractors have a workforce of 100 men and 30 teams on the excavation, which 14,000 cubic yards of earth and four pile drivers are driving piles. Quite the massive undertaking. This work was to be done by uh, mid-December and they were gonna have the boats already hauled out. All of the boats of the Northwest Transfer Transportation Company um, had made two trips to Benton each year. Some of them as well made trips to Fort Buford and Fort Wrights. So it was all more than deemed appropriate. And that wasn't enough for Mr. Lawrence. He added five more boats to his, um, to his fleet and expanded his warehouse even further. So by January of 1869, the ways were complete with the Bertha, the Fanny Parker, the North Alabama, and Deer Lodge 
all hauled up out without issue. It was expected that the work would be done at the ways it would employ about 40 to 50 carpenters every spring. We have a picture here. It is from 1868. And these boats were not in um, his fleet at the time. And this does not include the ways that gives you an idea of how Sioux City looked at the start of this real big boom. And pardon me again, I apologize. I can feel my voice going in and out. I'm going to uh, take another drink and be right back with you folks. Okay, so here we go. So Lawrence's company um, was huge by Sioux City standards. It operated at one point 20 steamboats, employed nearly 400 men during the shipping season. Other shippers, including the Coots Line of St. Louis and the Yankton Packet Company, also followed suit and opened offices on the levee near the railroad depot. Now, Lawrence knew how to navigate the trade networks and came to an arrangement with the railroad to work with them as partners. Um, Weary praise of Lawrence and his enterprise had grown into full-on admiration as the Sioux City Journal keeps praise upon this project, stating, we, had, we are glad that this company, and especially our fellow townsmen, Lawrence and Rollworth, were the getters up, that's quite the unique phrasing, and are the controlling parties in this enterprise. Had it been otherwise, in the competing line put into operation, it would have doubtless been done much damage to our vast upriver shipping interest, but as much as we are now shaped, it will be observed that things are as near as right as we can consistently desire them. For it is evident that no company will neglect that point of its business where the greatest part of its capital and interests are at stake. We heartily congratulate this company. Of all the different steamboat companies now doing business out of Sioux City, the Northwest Transportation Company was clearly the town's favorite. This is not unusual for steamboat towns to pick a particular company or boat, as we saw earlier, who they would praise and defend. Usually that favorite company was the one with the most ties to the community and had quite a bit of um, mud slinging towards the other companies in the area. By extension, they also had favorite captains and boats. In 1869, there was serious trouble on the Missouri River, though, a lack of water. The water levels dropped to historic levels. Insurance rates went up. Of the 24 boats destined for, Monta for Fort Benton in Montana, only 18 of them made it. And by 1870, only eight, 11 in 1871, 12 in 1872, and a dismal seven boats made it up to Fort Benton in 1873. However, there were still a great deal of departures and arrivals at Sioux City as goods to be transported to numerous Indian agencies throughout the Dakotas needed to leave from Sioux City and go up to points throughout um, the Dakotas. There was still very much an active Indian war going on. The military needed supplies and in some instances to transport their troops beyond the reaches of the railroad. Even the Canadian government found transport via the upper Missouri well suited for their needs. Sioux City really has always been uh, a town looking forward to the future, but now that their destiny had been obtained in many ways, they were really now becoming a city in transition and they were grappling with these changes. You start to see a subtle shift in attitude towards the steamboat business, which no doubt the problems on the Missouri River were rightfully a contributing factor to. The city was still dependent on steamboats, but its leaders and inhabitants were looking ahead to the future. They were a city of progress and steamboats were increasingly becoming a thing of the past. This change and at times contradictory attitude towards steamboats is evident in the city's newspapers, particularly the editorials. There was a back and forth between crediting the steamboat trade for the growth of the city and crediting them as an integral part of the trade network while downplaying the role that steamboats played. So some examples for it. April 27th, 1870, the Sioux City Journal detailed how 200 spectators watched the steamer berth that depart for Fort Benton. Three days later, an article about jobbing prospects appeared in which growth and business for opportunities were discussed at length. And while there was a passing reference to trade businesses, the word steamboat was not mentioned once in the article. In June, the Sioux City Journal had once again taken to reviewing business prospects but attempted to take a more historical approach to this discussion. They claimed that the merchant business had brought in over $1.8 million the previous year. Keep in mind, this is 
1870. And noted that more river business than at any other point in the Missouri was conducted at Sioux City with a total of 110 steamer arrivals and 107 departures. But the majority of the article was devoted to the newly arrived trains. Steamboats were at least mentioned in June 23rd of 1870 article where contributions of the steamboats were discussed, but again, more of the narrative was dedicated to railroads. The following spring, there was yet another flip in attitude. In May of 1871, the Sioux City Journal ran an article that was actually out of the Chicago Tribune that attested to the continued importance of steamboats, stating that the government demand would make sure the upper Missouri River business is not in danger of being destroyed by the advance of railroad interests. The town of Sioux City once again felt secure in their relationship with the steamboat business. The Sioux City and smartly capitalized on all this growth and included it in their efforts to try to attract and retain new citizens. For example, Daniel Scott of the Sioux City Commission of Immigration, published in March 1870 in the Seymour Times in Indiana, an ad in which he personally vouches for the business prospects in Sioux City as a resident of 18 years, which, do the math on that, you'll come up with some interesting numbers, and offers to send young man a guide on how to obtain 160 acres. He wrote, the Missouri River gives us the mountain trade. Thus it will be seen that no section of the country offers such unprecedented advantages for business, speculation, and making a fortune. Naturally, that guide would cost you a dollar to get. Now retaining settlers proved to be a challenge arguably just as much, if not more so, than attracting settlers. Fortunately for us, urban historian William, and I hope I'm pronouncing his last name right, Silag, completed an in-depth study of the population of Sioux City and found that the surge of economic growth following the railroad's arrival in the late 1860s prolonged and even exaggerated the demographic instability of the pioneer period. Silag also found that those who owned $1,000 or more in property was more likely to stay. When he examined the 1870 census, he found that as expected, transportation workers made up an important share of the labor force. Their numbers divided evenly among things like liveries, steamboat firms, and railroad companies. Except for a small number of men who continued to farm outlying acreages, most workers owned earned incomes as common laborers, either in the factories along the Perry Creek or in the warehouses at the levee. Moreover, the overall pattern of employment indicates the degree to which transportation improvements brought even greater balance and diversity to the local economy. Now, the seasonal nature of the work of, for laborers and the steamboats only exasperated this phenomenon, but it was nonetheless still good for Sioux City overall. The majority of steamboat men did not have $1,000 more in property. Those who made the big money in the steamboat business were the owners, the captains, and pilots of the boats. And some of these spent the money as quickly as they earned it. Now, despite Sioux City being the hub of the steamboat business, most of the steamboat men continued to only be temporary residents. The officers in particular stayed in hotels such as Northwestern. And the newspapers reported in the spring when they came back and when they checked into the hotels throughout the city, throughout the season. Many of the steamboat men continued to live in St. Louis or even as far away as Pittsburgh. In the 1870 census, like we have here, it might give up the impression that Captain James McGarry was living in the city, um, but he was actually living in hotels and he spent his winters either in uh, St. Louis or traveling to see family. Now, my own review of the 1870 census is consistent with the findings of Stilig, although I was looking at it from more of a strictly steamboatman's perspective. When I am searching through census records, um, such as this page, I look at indicators that someone worked in the steamboat trade. It's not as always obvious as steamboat captain like it was here, or shipwright even. Someone who is listed as a laborer may have been someone who helped load boats during the steamboat season or helped clear away the dirt for the building of the ways. They could also potentially have been uh, what were called rooster bouts or roosters who were at the bottom of the hierarchy of steamboat crews and pretty much in charge of every tedious, difficult, or gross task that you can think of. Um, 
I did also did not notice how uh, in Sioux City, you don't see the job description Riverman like you do down in St. Louis. Other titles that might come up in census records indicating someone worked for a steamboat trade would be obviously shipwright, ship carpenter, engineer, fireman, or pilot. As a boat usually had at least one, if not two of those working aboard. The same can be said for pilots, clerks, and mates. And of course the captains, there was only one per boat usually, although a boat may have multiple captains throughout the season, especially when business was bad. While the majority of the business for the Missouri River steamboat, steamboats was not carrying passengers, they also still had to have staff on board to serve the crew and the passengers they did have. These boats were basically floating hotels, so they came with cooks, stewards, and bartenders. And we actually have an excerpt here. This is the 1871-1872 um, city directory with P.A. Byrne, who I believe is Patrick Byrne, actually a cousin of my Captain McGarry. Uh, he evidently worked as a cook in both uh, a hotel, a couple hotels, and steamboat, which I'm still working on proving which one. So while the majority of the business for Missouri River boats, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> excuse me. So despite the downturn in river business, um, in 1870 and 1871, there were actually labor shortages. The steamboat men uh, were complaining about the lack of help. Two steamers were not able to depart as planned, um, the Far West and Andrew Ackley being those two, due to a shortage of deckhands. It used to be that they'd go from St. Louis to Sioux City with a small crew, and then once they got to Sioux City, they would fully staff up. But due to the large amount of projects going on in and around Sioux City, there was a labor shortage. Wages ex were expected to rise for steamboat crews as a result to help, intend, help entice them. By fall, the shortage had actually extended to um, the usually hot demand and already typically highest paid um, members of the crew pilots. All of the short supply and high demand has stimulated early labor movements, things like unions and all that sort of thing. You can have a history of those as well aboard the boats. Crews started striking more frequently in one search um, instance actually occurred aboard the steamer flirt in 1871. The crew did something that was a big taboo though. They made the mistake of waiting until after the boat had left the levee and they jumped off and would only get back on if they were paid more wages. The, that type of thing was a sin in the steamboat um, trade. And the captains and the clerks usually did not give in to strikes and demands for wages. And in this instance, it proved to be um, nothing different. And they actually hired a crew despite the labor shortage further up the river and actually paid them more wages. Now, despite the ups and downs of the steamboat trade and confused feelings that Sioux Cityans had about the business and boats themselves, steamboats and their crews remained a fairly regular part of the news. During steamboat season, a regular column in both the daily and weekly versions of the Sioux City Journal reported on the comings and goings of the boats, the type of freight shipped, and reprinted excerpts from the logbooks provided by the clerk of the steamboats. News from upriver was reported by those traveling, and sometimes those who had traveled provided letters or diaries, excerpts for publication. News of new boats, renovations, new lines, and first boats of the season made headlines. In 1871, two new lines were announced. Townsman uh, John H. Charles, who we heard from earlier, announced his interest in the newly formed Missouri River and Montana Transportation Company, which comprised of four boats, the A.H. Durfee, the Far West, the North, uh, the Nellie Peck, who was featured in the advertisement for this, and the Ida Reese. The Coons line boasted its line would also carry goods from uh, Pittsburgh and New Orleans to all points up the Missouri River, including up to Fort Benton. They had a larger fleet, which consisted of the Cary Coots, the Molly Moore, the Henry C. Yeager, May Larry, um, Kate P. Coots, the Penina, the Ida Stockdale, and the Andrew Ackley. Naturally, the addition of these lines helped alleviate some of the concerns that those in Sioux City had about uh, the loss of potential steamboat trade and reaffirmed Sioux City's role in that. Another example of what was made for a separate story uh, was the arrival of uh, the Andrew Ackley in April of 1871. 
The Sioux City Journal wrote, for a number of days, the arrival of Andrew Ackley from below has been anxiously looked for by our citizens. And the boat man now at this port. Yesterday afternoon, she came right down the bend and a large crowd of persons consisting of spectators, butchers, bakers, grocers, and solicitors generally gathered at the levee to welcome her and to secure whatever customs she might have in any way of her stores. I will add that uh, my beloved Captain McGarry was actually in command for that trip, um, something that also came out of this project's research. Now, as fixtures in society, steamboat officers like my Captain McGarry were in, deemed a particular interest. These guys were celebrities of their days. And tidbits of gossips about them appeared throughout um, different sections of the newspaper. We saw earlier that their comings and goings were frequently reported. If they, or sometimes even their children got married, didn't even matter if it was in Sioux City or back in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh, it was reported on. It was uh, big news in December of 1871 when Captain Grant Marsh went to Pittsburgh to oversee the building of Vanelli Peck. Stories of passengers interacting with the officers were also of interest. Hunting stories, especially involving hunting from the boat, were especially popular. But lower ranking steamboat men were usually not named or discussed unless there was a juicy story involved, like a crewman running off with someone else's wife or involved in a crime, like a murder. You know, Sioux City's reign as the hub uh, on the Missouri River began to weaken in 1872 with the completion of a short, short line railroad to Yankton. Arguably, Yankton was never really a hub for steamboat trade. It was more of a, a starting point for some boats. As in 1873, the Northern Pacific was completed at Bismarck, which I have a picture for you of what Bismarck looked like in 1874. Pretty, pretty dang desolate. Now, the impact of um, this would have been more significant if it hadn't been for the fact that in 1873 there was a panic, which slowed the growth of the railroads, but it did not lessen government demand for shipment of goods and troops, so this kind of helped prop up the steamboat trade a little bit longer. Overall, I find the relationship between Sioux City and steamboats to be very dynamic, dynamic unique, and interesting. It kind of feels like Sioux City was a, almost a fickle lover to steamboats. At one point, they had so much pride, but then they seemed reticent to acknowledge the need and the history at other times, even now looking back through old memoirs, such as, such as those as John H. Charles. Their falling in and out of love with steamboats also happened on a very condensed timeline. It wasn't a decades-long story like it was in St. Louis or even up at the head of navigation in Fort Benton, where steamboats are very much treasured today. I am still uh, digging into that aspect a little bit more. What there I have is that perhaps steamboats were somehow representative of Sioux City's early failures. And with the city being so forward thinking that they were eager to distance themselves from these early failures and the steamboats. Compared to other towns, their relationship wasn't quite as rosy and it seems like steamboats always needed Sioux City more than Sioux City felt like they needed them. And I apologize I, that my voice has been giving out on me so much today. I think I'm going to uh, call, uh, call it good there. <laughs> that way I can um, hopefully still answer some of your questions. Thank you, Cassie. Uh, we have some time to answer some questions. Uh, if you do have a question, please submit it through the Q&A feature on Zoom. Please note we may not be able to get all the questions and also Cassie, we'll see how you're feeling with your voice. We know you're pushing through, feels, we appreciate I that. I feel so bad. I will <laughs> record okay. it for you guys if you like. If anybody has any um, sore throat remedies, I'll also take those. <laughs> Well, we do have a few questions for you uh, that we would love for you to answer. So uh, first question we have here is, uh, what drew you originally to Captain James McGarry? Oh, I get that question a lot. It's kind of um, <laughs> it's kind of a funny story. So I have a background in genealogy. I worked as a professional genealogist for a while. There was actually a client of mine who came to me and she said, can you confirm if I'm related to the steamboat captain? It's always been family lore. And I was able to do that, but I was just kept finding all these crazy newspaper articles about him, all these things he did. And so after the project ended for her, I asked her permission if I could continue digging into her ancestor's life. And she was like, of course you can. Um, so that's kind of how it, it was. I, it's almost kind of like a, a thing of fate. Um, it always seems like the best research projects find you. 
Awesome. And that kind of brings us into the next question, too, just a little more about the background of your research. Um, what sparked your interest in studying kind of the specific geographical location of Sioux City and Northward in relation to steamboats? Um, it's an underappreciated area, and it's also an area where there's not been a lot um, written about. Uh, but to me, it's it's the most exciting. It's the most um, you have so many different aspects of history all coming together during such a crucial time period too, especially, you know, your the nation was coming out of the civil war, it was redefining itself. You had these Indian wars going on. Um, just, it was kind of like a, a big center point for multiple things. Awesome. And then another question we have for you, Cassie, is were you able to figure out why Sioux City was so quick to dismiss steamboats so early in their history, especially since the railroad was not quite as available in Western Iowa? I think it was um, connected to their early failures, I really do. And that's something I'm still continuing to, to research because it's a bit odd that they kept flip-flopping on their attitude. And, and even today, um, if, you, if you talk to people about Sioux City, they, they kind of like skip over steamboats. And the city was the hub from 1868 mm -hmm. to 1873, but that almost seems to be glossed over. And you hear mostly about railroads. Yes, for sure. Um, and just a few more questions for you, Cassie, and then sure. we'll let your voice get some rest. Um, <laughs> I'm trying, guys. <laughs> um, did you have, while you were doing your research, was there a favorite source that you found um, that either was super interesting or that you found super useful to your research? I am always a big fan of newspapers, um, especially for actually in all of my my projects. Um you have to be a little bit careful because there can be some bias in those newspapers, especially by the editors of the journals. We kind of talked about that a little bit, how they always have like a favorite company, favorite captain, a favorite boat. Um, but the thing I like about it is that it lets you kind of get an on the ground perspective that you can track from week to week. And they're very unique in that, um, in that nature. It can be kind of difficult to find other records from that era, things like diaries or letters that reflect um, how people felt and so this is kind of, those are kind of like the good way. Um, and I always find census records just absolutely fascinating to see the population's disbursement, but newspapers are, are always my, my love. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And we are going to make this our last question here uh, before we will close out a little early today. Um, but we know your research is ongoing, but where can people find out more about your research? Um, well, I still owe... Um, an article on this. And so I'm, I'm in the, the writing stages of that. So hopefully that'll get published in the future. Um, and I'm looking at other ways that I can I can get out there, hopefully do a few more presentations, re-record this one for you. Um, and I am on Twitter if anybody wants to try and follow me there. I don't always talk just history, um, but I am there at Cassie L. Nelson. Um, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll get it out there. I'm, I'm still working on that a little bit. So if anybody has any ideas, throw them my way. Awesome. And with that answer, we will bring this webinar to a close a little early. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, and we would like to extend one last thank you to our presenter, Cassie. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. For more information and to register for future webinars in this series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. While you are there, you can look into some of our other fantastic digital programs, such as Goldie's Kids Club Activities for Young Historians. We look forward to seeing you all in uh, virtually in 2023 when the Iowa History 101 webinars resume on Thursday, January 12th. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon.